This episode of On the Bookshelf, featuring Christopher Klein, is sponsored by the Winthrop Book Depot and Cafe, located at 11 Somerset Avenue in Winthrop, Massachusetts. Don't know much about history. That's the first line from Sam Cooke's classic song, What a Wonderful World It Would Be. History, we all took it in school, and one of the things we discovered was, the more you know about history, the more you realize how little you know. In his new book, Christopher Klein has created a book about a part of history none of us knew, when the Irish invaded Canada. And now, a look at the book, an excerpt as read by the author. Thirteen months after Robert E. Lee laid down his sword at Appomattox Courthouse, former Confederate rebels slipped on their gray wool jackets. Union veterans looking, longing to emancipate an oppressed people donned their blue capes. Battle-hardened warriors from both the North and the South returned to their front lines, but not to reignite the Civil War. Instead, the former foes became improbable brothers in arms united against a common enemy, Great Britain. Entwined by Irish bloodlines, the private army that congregated on the south side of Buffalo, New York on the night of May 31, 1866, shared not just a craving for gunpowder, but a yearning to liberate their homeland from the shackles of the British Empire. For 700 years, British rulers attempted to extinguish Ireland's religion, culture, and language, and when the potato crop failed in the 1840s and 1850s, causing one million people to die, some Irish believed that the British were trying to exterminate them as well. Many of the two million refugees fleeing the Great Hunger washed ashore in the United States, where the newcomers continued to face the scorn of nativist know-nothings, who believed the Irish had no intention of assimilating into American culture, but plotted to take handout after handout while imposing papal law on their adopted home. Even from a distance of nearly 15 years and 3,000 miles, the trauma remained raw for many of the insurgents who enlisted in the self-proclaimed Irish Republican Army. Radicalized by their collective ordeal, these Irish-American Civil War veterans viewed their service in the bloody crucibles of Bull Run, Antietam, Gettysburg as training for the real fight they wanted to wage, one to free Ireland. Wearing green ribbons tied to their hats and fastened to their buttonholes, 800 Irish paramilitaries who had traveled from as far away as New Orleans emerged from the boarding houses and saloons of Buffalo's Irish enclave, the First Ward, on a clear spring night, carrying green flags sewn by their wives, girlfriends, and mothers, and hauling nine wagons laden with secretly so stockpiled rifles and ammunition, the Irish Republican Army set off on one of the most fantastical missions in military history, to kidnap Canada. Bred to hate the British, the 32-year-old Colonel John O'Neill was fulfilling his boyhood dream as he led the Irish Republican Army on his march northward. The governing passion of my life, apart from my duty to my God, is to be at the head of an Irish army battling against England for Ireland's rights, he declared. For this I live, and for this, if necessary, I am willing to die. O'Neill could neither forgive the British for the unspeakable horrors that he had witnessed as a boy coming of, a, coming of age during the Great Hunger, nor forget his grandfather's soul-stirring tales of 17th century ancestors who dared to take up arms against the crown. Although they did not deliver, did, although they did not deliver freedom to Ireland, the young lad learned that just the mere act of fighting the British could render an Irishman a hero. After leading the Irish Republican Army on their six-mile march through Buffalo, O'Neill halted his troops at a dock near the Pratt & Company blast furnace, where the distance across the Niagara River was among its narrowest. As the Irish colonel surveyed his ragtag force clad in blue, gray, and green, he saw grizzled bearded men and fair-skinned boys, Catholics and Protestants, Yankees and Rebs. As O'Neill squinted into the darkness, he could faintly make out the enemy territory 1,000 yards across the river. Awaiting the troops were two steam tugs and four canal boats, which had been procured by an Irishman posing as a foundry owner seeking to transport his employees to a company picnic on Grand Island. With Canadian Defense Forces stationed miles away, the Irishman easily slipped across the international boundary. The soldiers shook the American dust off their boots and planted their feet firmly on the soil of the British Empire. The Irish Republican Army's invasion of Canada had begun. A bit of the 2019 book, 
When the Irish Invaded Canada, as read by the author Christopher Klein. Chris, thank you very much for joining us. It's a pleasure to meet you. Thank you. Do you remember the first time you heard that this uh, part of history existed? Well, my last book I wrote was about uh, John L. Sullivan, who was an Irish-American boxer from Boston. And when I was doing research on one of his opponents in the ring, there was a mention that he was a veteran of the attack on Canada. And I sort of did a double take. I had no idea what they were referring to. And I dug into it and found out that there was this invasion by an Irish-American army, uh, and not just once, but five times between 1866 and 1871. I know you've had a great interest in history. Do you remember as a boy what triggered that uh, great interest? Was there something you learned in school or something you stumbled over that made you want to study more history? Yeah, um, I think it was sort of inbred by my parents, too. I remember... Uh, taking a lot of walking tours around New York City with my dad, just looking at a lot of historical sites and, and sightseeing. And at a very early age, I probably had a very abnormal interest in the presidents, you know, being able to name all of them probably when I was a, a second grader. And uh, so at a very early age, you know, history was something that I was really drawn into. Now you grew up in Andover, went to Andover High School. It's about four hours by car to go from Andover to Madison, New Jersey. What prompted you to spend your years as a summa cum laude graduate at Drew University? Uh, I, had, uh, lived, I was born in New York City, lived in New Jersey for a little bit, so I was familiar with the area. And Drew University uh, is a liberal arts college, about 1,200 students. So I was looking for a small liberal arts college and also was a political science major and they had a very strong political science uh, program there. Uh, one semester there I did a program that they have at the United Nations. So it was a great way to, to get a good education and then also to have New York City there, just a short train ride away to be able to explore. Sure. When you were in college, uh, were your thoughts on uh, politics as a career, maybe getting involved in a campaign and going from there? Or did you consider your, uh, future writing or a future as a historian? So I was thinking that, yeah, I'd probably get involved in some political campaign or work for a nonprofit. Uh, but, you know, I, I found even in high school, but in, in college, you know, I, I really loved doing research papers. You know, it was, again, sort of this strange characteristic. But I, I loved the process of, of doing research. And, you know, I knew that that's something I wanted to continue with. Looking back, you know, I do wish that I had more of an idea that I did, you know, of, of becoming a writer at that point. So I could have maybe immersed myself a little bit more in some of the other history and English courses that they had. But it really was this, this love of doing the research and delving into a topic that, that is something I wanted to continue afterwards. We'll have an opportunity to talk about your current book in a moment, but I want to back up a step. Strong Boy, The Life and Times of John L. Sullivan, America's First Sports Hero, was your last book. That, as you noted, was takes place in the, uh, in the 19th century, and uh, so does this book. Did the research you did on the John L. Sullivan book help you when you did the research on the new one? Yeah, absolutely, because um, both books actually really have the same starting point, which is back in Ireland during the Great Hunger. That's really the kickoff to, mm -hmm. to both those stories. And I was familiar with doing, you know, the research for that time period, so that was a big help. What I really found, though, was in writing Strong Boy, I'm not really a big boxing fan per se. And it was undeniable that, that these fights were colorful events, and, and that drew me in, in part. But it was also the ability to tell this story about this first generation of Irish uh, Americans who were born here in America, mm -hmm. view themselves as Americans first, Irish second, who come of age, and really John L. Sullivan re representing that the Irish coming to power you know, in, in the United States in, in the 1880s, 1890s. Uh, with when the Irish invaded Canada, sort of similar. I'm, I'm not a military historian. I'm not one who really knows the minutia of, of Civil War battles. But what really drew me into the story was, again, this is sort of, in a way, I think, a prequel to Strong Boy, because here I'm telling the story of those Irish who did have to flee their homeland because of the great hunger and then struggled to try to gain a foothold here in the United States and still 
um, even after living in the country for 20 years, would view themselves as Irish, mm -hmm. first, American, second. We should note that uh, Strongboy received the Bella Kornitzer Award from your alma mater, Drew University. Bella Kornitzer uh, was uh, an author and a journalist in both Hungary and the United States. When he was here, he interviewed five presidents. What did winning that award mean to you? Uh, it meant a lot. It was, you know, great to have that connection back to Drew University and, and, and at my alma mater. And, you know, it's, it's an award that not only alumni but professors uh, are also receive, so it was great to have that recognition. So we've talked about two of your books. Let's just touch on the other two. I'll bet it was fun to write uh, Die Hard Sports Fan's Guide to Boston. Absolutely, yeah. I had to eat a lot of hot dogs, go to a lot of games, someone had to do it though. So uh, yes, that was, a, that was a great project. And you uh, wrote a book that uh, you told me you were updating, Discovering Boston's Harbor Islands. What was that like? Another great project. You get to spend the summer out on the boats and going around to all the islands. If growing, you see, it was interesting for me growing up in Andover. Didn't really know much about the Boston Harbor Islands. I think I had traveled to Australia twice before I set foot on one of these Harbor Islands. So it's not like here in Winthrop when they're literally right in your backyard. Sure. So it was a real interesting project for me because I got to not only visit these islands uh, on a regular basis for the first time, but then also to see how incredible it is that each island really has its own individual history out there uh, connected to the city and some of the seminal moments in American history too. So we're anxious to talk about when the Irish invaded Canada and uh, the book is, the, the research is, is amazing. Uh, as testimony to this, uh, following the narrative, there are 30 pages of uh, acknowledgments and notes and bibliography. Uh, how long did it take you to write the book? And as the research continued, uh, what did you learn along the way? So it took me about a year and a half to do the, the book. I would have guessed uh, longer. Yes, and that's probably what I learned along the way. Is <laughs> I should have given myself uh, a lot longer to, to have done that. So I think I finally hit my fourth deadline. So my hat's off to my editor for being a little bit flexible. Uh, with that. And, you know, very much like my other books, this, is a, this was a subject that really I did not know much about until I started doing the research and digging into it. And I think what the biggest surprise to me in doing the research was that, um, you know, this idea is not as crazy as it sounds to us today. And it was very much in keeping with an American tradition of invading Canada every generation or so in the first American century. And um, it wasn't just the Irish who had this idea of invading Canada. There were United States senators after the Civil War who were sort of proposing the same thing um, to invade Canada as a way to get some reparations paid by Great Britain for their support of the Confederacy, tacit support of the Confederacy during mm -hmm. the Civil War. We should put things in perspective uh, from the Irish point of view, and that's how the book is written. For 700 years, uh, the Irish were under British rule, and it was a spiky sort of relationship. And of course, you alluded to the potato famine. Uh, this was a horrible moment in Irish history, uh, and there was a feeling that uh, Great Britain didn't step up and, and come to their aid. Uh, could you elaborate on that? Sure. I mean, you have, uh, like you said, the British colonizing Ireland for 700 years. And the British had long talked about the Irish problem. And the Irish problem in the minds of the British was that the Irish weren't British. And they tried for seven centuries to get them to try to anglicize them. But Ireland may have been subjected, subjugated, but it was never conquered because it was able to keep its religion and its culture and its, its language. And then along comes the failure of the potato crop in the 1840s. And you have one million Irish who die. You have two million who are forced to flee the island. And you will hear um, a lot of people not refer to it as a famine anymore because of some scholarship that has been done about um, that at the same time when Ireland needed every bit of food that it could, that it could get, uh, there was the export of wheat and oats and barley under armed guard out of out of Ireland. Uh, so a lot of the Irish will refer to this now as the great hunger. And you just can imagine that having endured 
seven centuries of colonization and then to see family members die and then to be forced to have to flee your homeland and then take a passage across the Atlantic, which could be deadly, so deadly that they refer to the ships that transported these Irish as, as coffin ships, um, that if we were gonna to use today's parlance, we'd say that these Irish, were, they were radicalized by their experience living under the British, and that trauma will remain with them um, even after putting on uniforms to fight for the United States to preserve it. The Union, that that's still with them. One of the interesting things is some of the Irish fought for the blue, some of the Irish fought for the gray. That's right. So there's an Irish scholar named Damien Shields, and he's done research, and he's estimated there is about 200,000 native Irish who fought for the Union cause, about 20,000 for the Confederate cause. And who you fought for was generally just a matter of geography, where you happened to have landed when you came to the United States, and you, you were, in essence, fighting for... Um, your home team that, that, that you were with. So uh, the Irish who fought for the Union, they were not necessarily doing it to fight for the, for the freedom of the slaves. They were doing it uh, to prove their patriotism to know nothings. To, uh, for many of them, it was to get a paycheck. Um, they didn't expect the war to last too long. So this was a way for the Irish who were still at the bottom of the economic rung to, to get a paycheck. Uh, but for the most militant of the Irish, they thought that uh, the Civil War would be a training ground for them to learn battlefield tactics, weaponry, and they were going to go use that to uh, fight the British. So this was in the back of their minds through their whole war experience here? For some of them, yes. Yeah. So there's an organization called the Fenian Brotherhood, which is really the organization that is behind uh, this, this I idea of uh, revolution against the British. And it's a sister organization to a group called the Irish Republican Brotherhood that was formed in Ireland. And the idea was that away from the British with the freedoms that America provided, the Irish in America would raise money and purchase weapons. They would ship it back to Ireland and uh, the Irish Republican Brotherhood would put together the army that would lead an uprising in Ireland. And due to circumstances, the British find out about this plan and will crack down upon it at the same time that there's a group of Fenian members who say, why are we trying to launch a revolution clear across the ocean when we can strike the British Empire a train right away where we can get on a train in Boston, be at the border overnight, and we can walk right across into the British colony of Canada. And we, we should note, as you write in the book, that Canada was known as British North America. Yes. So it's not the, the flag that's flying over uh, Canada. It's not the maple leaf that we're all familiar with today. It is the Union Jack, which is the hated symbol for these Irish who are launching the attack. And these men were so passionate, they've left one war, they're ready to roll up their sleeves and engage in another. Yes, absolutely. And I think that just goes to speak to the trauma that they had endured, the, the, the experiences that they had uh, living under the British, that they're, they're, they are years removed from living in Ireland, but they still carry with them their love of their homeland and their hatred of the British at the same time. So uh, these men are coming together. What's the U.S. role in, in this? So this was really interesting to me in doing the research. So there are laws on the book, the neutrality laws, that prevent private citizens from actively engaging in war against a country with which the United States is at peace. So you would think that the United States would be doing everything in its power to quell this uprising by the Fenian Brotherhood. But what actually is occurring is that it has the tacit support of the White House in the months after the Civil War because of the uh, British stance during the Civil War in remaining neutral to the eyes of the Union. They may as well have been siding with the Confederacy. Mm -hmm. But on top of that, there were Confederate warships that were built in British uh, ports, such as Liverpool. Uh, guns that were used by the Confederacy were also manufactured in Great Britain. So there is a lot of animosity at the end of the war. And President Andrew Johnson wants the British to pay reparations for all the damage that is done by these British warships. Uh, the most fearsome of which was the CSS Alabama, which terrorized Union shipping for 
uh, a good couple of years. And these are the so-called Alabama claims, is what they call these reparations that President Johnson is interested in having the British pay off. So uh, Johnson is looking for any way that he can to put leverage on the British. And um, in the fall of 1865, here come the Fenians in a meeting into uh, the White House with Johnson and Secretary of State William Seward. And according to the Fenians, and this is the only source that we have, so we have to take that into account, they, um, they tell Johnson about his plan. And according to uh, the Fenians, Johnson says that he will, quote, acknowledge accomplished facts, which they take to mean that Johnson's going to turn a blind eye. He's not going to get in the way of their making uh, an attack on Canada, but he's not going to actively support them either. So ultimately, there are five Fenian raids, and none of them are really successful. Are they successful be, uh, unsuccessful because uh, they're undermanned, or they underestimate what they're dealing with when they cross the border or, uh, in, in capsule form? Uh, tell us about that. So their most successful raid is one that they launch in June of 1866, where the first, they're the first, the first real major attack that they have. And um, John O'Neill... Uh, leads his men across the Niagara River, and they will uh, get the first victory over a force of the British Empire by an Irish army since 1745. So what the real failures, though, of that uh, attack and the subsequent ones really are is that, yes, they are tremendously undermanned versus what the plan is going to be. And part of that has to do with that they were very easy to infiltrate uh, by Canadian spies, by British spies. Uh, it was pretty much known their every movement. You didn't even necessarily have to have spies in there. If you just had a newspaper subscription, you would, you would sort of know what the doings of the Fenian uh, Brotherhood was. So uh, they, they were easily infiltrated. Their forces were never, uh, that showed up at the border, were never as much as what the military planners would have. So they would go in tremendously undermanned into these into these battles. So that was uh, that was one of the, one of their failures. The second is one that we see to this very day when it comes to American military invasions is that uh, the Fenians thought that they would be greeted as liberators uh, among many of the Canadians who they, they they thought that the French speakers in Quebec would have the same hatred of the British as they would, and they expected all the Irish who lived, uh, all the Irish immigrants in Canada would also want to cast off British rule and join them in, in this uprising as well. So they estimated that uh, the hundreds of thousands of uh, Irish immigrants in Canada, as soon as they crossed the border, were going to rise up and join with them. Any of the Irish born who were in the uh, military, uh, the Canadian militias, British Army, were going to do the same. And lo and behold, they crossed the border and that did not happen. There was not this pop popular uprising in Canada, they expected that was going to help to uh, carry them forward further into Canadian territory. Christopher Klein is our guest on On the Bookshelf, and we're talking about the book, When the Irish Invaded Canada. There are some characters in this book who literally leap off the page, and there are a couple, if you will, I'd like to ask you about, beginning with James Stevens. James Stevens, he is uh, the, he's where the, the book starts. So he is a leader of this revolutionary movement called Young Ireland in 1848 that attempts a revolution in the middle of the Great Hunger. The timing was not good. Ireland's just trying to survive, uh, cannot uh, man a, a, a revolution against the British. Uh, but James Stevens is very interesting because he is badly wounded at a shootout with, uh, with the police who leave him on the side of the road for dead. With one arm. Yeah. Um, and he, he, is, he is shot, left for dead, and he sort of pulls a page right out of Mark Twain and uh, fakes his own death. Mm -hmm. So they run his obituary in his local newspaper in Kilkenny, Ireland. His father carries a coffin full of rocks and buries it in the local cemetery. So everyone thinks James Stevens is dead, but he's on the lam. Uh, through the mountains of Ireland, he finally escapes uh, in disguise over to England. Uh, 
spends a night uh, right across the street from Buckingham Palace under the nose of Queen Victoria, unbeknownst to her, and manages to escape to Paris. And he is then, uh, 10 years later, the founder of the Irish Republican Brotherhood in Ireland and is, is really one of the two main figures uh, in, in, in plotting this next revolution in Ireland that, that he wants to stage. And briefly, could we talk about Thomas Sweeney? So Thomas Sweeney, he is, uh, he's really the epitome of the fighting Irish. So this is a guy who uh, immigrated to America when he was 11 years old and is swept off the deck of his ship uh, into the Atlantic Ocean and manages to survive a half hour before he's finally rescued. And uh, he fights in the Mexican-American War, loses an arm there, still keeps on serving in the military, fights in the Civil War, takes two more gunshots to his remaining arm, another one in the leg. And then after the war, he signs up to become the Fenian Secretary of War. And it's really Thomas Sweeney who is in this faction of Fenians who's, who thinks it's a crazy idea to launch this revolution in Ireland, wants to do it in Canada. And he is the architect of the main invasion in 1866. He plans this five-pronged invasion with amphibious uh, invasions launched from Chicago and Cleveland across the Great Lakes and from Detroit and Buffalo, uh, where they're all going to converge on Toronto. But it's all a feint because he plans for a 17,000-man army to go right up through the Lake Champlain Valley to capture Montreal and then Quebec and then the St. Lawrence uh, River, and then that way they'll control the shipping in and out of Canada. When the Irish invaded Canada is a fascinating read, um, made more so by the fact that it's something none of us knew about. Uh, what's your next project? <laughs> I'm not sure what it is now. I mean, there is another story about Irish America. It's set in the same time period that, that I'm thinking about, but i um, not sure what the next one is going to be. I, I keep keep scouring those footnotes and uh, little obscure references and, and see if I might find something in there. In the meantime, you're a most prolific writer, newspaper articles and magazine articles and, and things of that nature, and on varied subjects. It, it's, it's quite interesting to go back and, and look at all the many things you've accomplished. Well, thank you, thank you. I, I mean, I, I love history, so I, I do a lot of writing with uh, the History Channel's website, history.com. and. It's great because every assignment I get, it's, it's a learning experience for me and it's something I can uh, delve into something I'm, I'm passionate about and also get to write about, so I love doing it. As you continue to do it, does it get easier? Never gets easier. The writing never, the writing never gets easier. The research uh, gets a little bit easier. The writing never gets easier. That's always, uh, it's always a challenge, but you know, it's always a different, um, you know, a different solution that you have to find. So you have to sort of figure out your own puzzle that way, how you're going to approach a story, how you're going to get into it, how are you going to structure it. But um, once you get through the this, this second or third draft, then it feels great. The first drafts are still painful. Christopher Klein, we can't thank you enough for coming and visiting with us and telling us about a, a story that we're all first learning about, and that's when the Irish invaded Canada. Thank you so much. Thank you. And here. thank you for joining us on this edition of On the Bookshelf. This episode of On the Bookshelf featuring Christopher Klein was sponsored by the Winthrop Book Depot and Cafe, located at 11 Somerset Avenue in Winthrop, Massachusetts. I was 0.5 credits away from completing high school and I didn't do it. My support team never stopped pushing for me to be better because they knew who I could become as a person. I've been given an opportunity and 
I'm just thankful for it. Find free adult education classes near you at finishyourdiploma.org.